Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, next is the most awaited uh, uh, session of uh, uh, this uh, conference. It's uh, uh, Heroes of uh, Indian Ophthalmology. Uh, we have uh, two of the most eminent uh, uh, personalities uh, in India, Patmasri Dr. Titial and Patmasri Dr. R. V. Ramani. I, I request uh, uh, Titial sir and uh, uh, R. V. sir to come up on stage. Uh, Dr. Sai, uh, Dr. Namrada, please. So first, uh, uh, Dr. J. S. Titial. Uh, sir is the chief and professor uh, at uh, Dr. R. P. Center for Ophthalmic Sciences at Ames, uh, New Delhi. He has more than 400 publications, greater than 3,500 citations, six books, more than 60 chapters. He has delivered more than 50 orations and keynote addresses, huge lot of live surgical demonstrations. He's been regularly conducting instruction courses in AAO, ASCRS, ESCRS, APAO, APSCRS, and obviously AOS conferences. He has two patents uh, uh, to his credit. Uh, he has won a lot of uh, international uh, awards, uh, including Distinguished Service Award in APAO 2021, Senior Achievement Award and Achievement Awards, AAO and APAO, APACR is certificate, Certified Educator, first Indian to perform live surgery in ASCRS in USA, he was awarded Padma Sri by President of India in the year 2014, P. Shivaradi International Award in AOS 21-22, R.P. Danda Award, AOS 2021, has won four gold medals. He is uh, President of uh, Indian Society of Cornea and Keratorefractive Surgeons, Chairman of National Eye Bank at RP Center, he was the president of DOS in 2013-14 and secretary DOS 2003-2005. I, I request uh, uh, Dr. Namrada Sharma and uh, 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 Dr. Sai uh, to hand over the uh, award uh, uh, to him. Uh, I now request uh, Sir to deliver his talk on advances in uh, phacal emulsification. Good morning, friends. Indeed, uh, it's a real honor to be present here in this house. I'd like to thank uh, KSOS Scientific Committee and the Organizing Committee for uh, such a kind honor to me. Yeah. I would like uh, every society to harbor the nature in a way where the academics becomes a forefront. And that is what uh, KSOS has been doing for such a long time. And uh, getting the award of uh, Heroes of Indian Ophthalmology, I don't know what is this, but I feel uh, really proud that I've been labeled as a hero. <laughs> Everybody in the uh, field of uh, patient care is a hero because we do something, service to a person, service to the community, service to the nation, and uh, whatever work we do is for a benefit of other person. If somebody does something for other person, nothing can be you know, titrated in terms of benefit to uh, that individual, but it goes to the entire society. And cataract being my field of uh, attraction in terms of doing surgeries and patient care, I would like to talk something how my journey started uh, in the, when I started doing my residency program in Ames and subsequently become a faculty and how did I keep up with the pace, with the changing technology, changing aspects of a patient care in relation to cataract surgery. 
I hope uh, you will bear with my uh, talk today. No financial disclosure. We all understand entire gamut of uh, surgical aspect of ophthalmic surgery changed because of two important things. One was microsurgery came into practice in late 80s. And subsequently, the intraocular lenses changed the entire concept of a management of a cataract patient in terms of giving the quality of vision which patient would require. Not only the visual equity, we looked into quality of vision. And these two things changed the entire scenario of cataract surgery. And luckily, we went through the entire advancement at that era. This change in a surgical technology was equally supported by the diagnostics, because without having a good diagnostics, you could never achieve the perfection in these areas. In recent time, we have included the state-of-the-art uh, diagnostic devices, which will help in correctly diagnosing the ailment, as well as deciding the, which would be the best way to treat that patient by doing various things. So if you have patient, if you have uh, students, you require an infrastructure. And that is what we looked in the aims to build up a world-class infrastructure in all fields, including entry segment, post segment, oculoplasty, tumor, name anything, and that will support the uh, future advancement in these areas. The infrastructure is one which will support the advancement happening in these areas, right from the patient coming to the OPD, the OPD diagnostics, the indoor uh, facilities, and the most important, the OT facility has to be matching the requirement of present day in these cases. One other important thing which happened in the last uh, two, three decades was the training of people. And nothing better than establishing wet lab training for our students where they can establish themselves as the uh, good technical hand and subsequently translate that to a patient care and surgeries. So we had the National Ophthalmic Surgical Skill Development Center started way back in our 80s and subsequently innovated, renovated that to a world-class facility to happen with all simulated uh, systems and uh, one of the best infrastructure for uh, doing a wet lab in a uh, wet lab station where you have state-of-the-art machines right from uh, we started with the infinity. Now we have a uh, centurion systems to people to do a surgery in our wet lab conditions and doing a proper assessment for our students. That also helps the teachers also how they're going to treat each and every step of surgery from done from patient and their video recordings are reassessed, reevaluated, and retreated to make them a perfection in these areas. Not only the cataract area, we looked into all aspects of uh, ocular surgeries which can be trained in a wet lab condition without the stress of uh, actually damaging the patient. And everybody, every student now has to go through this wet lab training, get the certification to do a surgery in a human eye. And that has really changed the concept. Keeping the pace with the technology, I would be an entry segment surgeon. I'm just highlighting two, three areas. I'll take you to, to the cataract surgery. I think that is a, has been the real challenge. And it will be a challenge for future also, the Indian scenario to keep up with the advancement happening world over. And if you start uh, looking to my journey, started way back in 1984 with different things coming in between the intraocular lenses, the multifocal IOLs. Now we talk about EDOF, trifocal lenses, the headset devices. All this has impact on our, my journey into cataract surgery. Let me take you through the intraocular lenses wise. We all looked into various lenses, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, name anything we did uh, those lenses. The important thing was looking for a quality of vision, decreasing the posterior capsular opacification happening in these patients, protection of the uveal tissues by giving up biocompatible areas, and always aimed for the decrease in the incision size. The incision size decrease will to correlate to the early rehabilitation of these patients, and that was possible by having the foldable lenses coming in your practice. And incision we started from uh, 3.2 with FACO, now it is less than two millimeter, and that has been a change in these cases. We all understand PMM IOL are the practice of today, basically focused onto the quality of vision rather than looking for uh, equity for these patients. And that has added by the various investigative technology, which will help you pre-op assessment as well as post-op assessment of your premium IOLs, especially ray tracing technologies, which gives you the ideal analysis of uh, aberration of uh, eye then you can decide which IOL can be put in those cases. And post-op also, you can manage these patients by doing a wavefront 
uh, technology assessment. If you require toric lenses to be reassessed, re-rotate, uh, that will all be decided by these cases. And when you have the aberration profile of eye, you can always think of a best option of these cases. In, the, in between the cataract surgery, femtosecond, we had the invention of femtosecond laser system coming for cataract surgery also in 2008 and 9, and we acquired that in 2013-14 RP Center. The main assessment and the propagation of femtosecond was it will decrease the energy use inside the eye, and that will translate into a less damage to the ocular structures and better rehabilitation of these patients. We compared the various types of uh, laser uh, nuclear fragmentations, and we realized some type of fragmentation will have added advantage over the other type of fragmentation ha happening in the nucleus emulsification in these cases. We could assess the incision very, very clearly compared with the manual incisions in a prospective manner, and we realized that incision created by the femtosecond laser will give actual three planar incisions and lesser damage to the incision and retaining the better configuration at the end of surgery also and less complications subsequently. How did this femtosecond laser give advantage to us in terms of looking into the difficult situation like white cataract, posterior polar, subluxated in these areas? This is one of the first study where we could compare the capsulotomy versus capsular excess, that is femtosecond created caps capsulotomy versus the manual created capsular excess in a white intumescent cataracts because that was a difficult area. And we could realize femtosecond gave an advantage of giving a good circular capsular excess or capsulotomy as compared to a manual one, and the chances of a retaining a good centralized uh, capsular opening and better effective lens position was much better with the femtosecond laser. The outcome was, visual acuity was not different, but the actual achievement of a right opening in the capsule was better with the femtosecond laser. Second area which I could translate was into fem femtosecond into a posterior polar cataract. We all talked about doing a slow motion FACO, doing the effective creation of a cushion to protect the posterior capsule. That can be done by femtosecond laser by actually doing the uh, chop and the uh, safety panel rings. So we could create a three rings of a nucleus fragmentation with uh, six chops. And that gave a fragmentation of nucleus inside the uh, open capsule, which you did in a capsulotomy, without opening the eye. And you didn't have require the hydro dissection or hydro dilation to be done in these cases, which is access contraindicated in a posterior polar cataract. We could do entire surgery without doing all these procedures and come out with a good safety area, especially in a cataract, which is a little harder. If you have soft cataract, you can just put a three rings of laser delineation and you can come out. But if you have a little harder cataract, this chop pattern, which I call hybrid pattern, gave a very good results. And this was one of the first publications in this regard. You could translate that into a into very difficult subluxation cataract also. In subluxation, as soon as you make an incision with a blade or keratome, entire lens diaphragm comes up and your subluxation increases. The bitters might come out. The femtosecond laser gives advantage of uh, getting all these difficult situations, capsulotomy, nuclear fragmentation, and incision without opening the eye and retaining the configuration as it is and completing the surgery possible. This was the first case report in, published in IGO where we could do a femtosecond laser in a patient where a bitrus was in the anterior chamber. Normally, people used to say bitrus would be a contraindication for uh, applying the femtosecond laser as such because it may not allow the actual placement of, as uh, you can see, a bitrus in the anterior chamber, the blob. And we could do a nice capsulotomy in this patient also and subsequently complete the surgery effectively without uh, requiring to do a, a Manipulation of taking out the entire nucleus, then back coming out, vitreous coming out, and it could be managed effectively. In fact, the capsular excess, capsulotomy as was as strong as capsular excess, where you could put a hooks also to maintain the capsular back integrity during your FACO surgery. So femtosecond could directly be applied to these difficult situations also, and uh, we could take out a vitreous first before we doing a nuclear fragmentation. Once you do a fragmentation, you can do everything. Here also, you don't require to do a hydro procedures because of a nuclear fragmentation and delineation happening in these patients. The femtosecond was also useful in cases, difficult situations like a patient who already had a faking eye wells, uh, like a, uh, ICLs or the very sized lens in the anterior chamber. We could do a femtosecond laser there, apply them before you open the eye and do a nice capsular axis capsulotomy 
fragmentation and do your surgery completely. The femtosecond was real added advantage in innovating your surgical technique and improving your outcome in these cases. Then came the image guided systems in between. We all were doing manual uh, markings for our toric lenses. Image guided added one more dimension to your premium IOS. And we compared the image guided system versus the manual image, uh, manual marking for a toric lenses. And we could realize the deviation from the axis was less significantly, statistically significantly with the image guided system as compared to the manual thing. And effectively, this translated into better visual quality. You see here modulation transfer function and point star function are better with image guided systems. Today, if you are doing a toric eyewell, there may be a multifocal toric lens. So this is a need of R to have a very good marking or a very good image guided system to give you a good access to your toric eyewells with multifocal lenses access. So we are looking for a visual quality. Visual equity will be assessed be there for all patients. Then we had an interop abrometry to give you access to a IOL power calculation AFAQ situations and the titrate your lens after implanting inside the eye if they are in a correct position. And this was much more beneficial for those cases where you had a refractive surprise. So this was one case where we had a refractive surprise after the FACO in a la post LASIK patient where I ex explanted the lens and did an interop abrometry, interop refraction onto the eye and decided what was eye well and we had a terrific outcome subsequently. All the new devices will give you opportunity to improve your surgical outcome for patient and also gives an opportunity for improving your research in those areas also. Then came the microscope which were integrated with uh, OCTs. OCT is a now compulsory part of your routine ophthalmic practice. It may be uh, diagnostic wise, it may be helping you in terms of planning, it may help you in a post-op assessment, but now it is actually helping you in the surgery. It came with a vitro-retina surgery, but it has become more effective for anti segment surgery also. So this is what I applied this into a white cataract. We could classify the intervention white cataract in a four types, and it may have a spectrum in between one, type two, type three, type three, type four, but classically they could be translated into four types. This is type one where after you initiate the capsular axis, what happens? Because the OCT will give you the dynamics of procedure. Once you puncture the capsule, when, once you start doing capsular dexes, what happens to the entire lens diaphragm is important. In type one, you can see nothing happens because it's very stable. You can do a capsular dexes without any difficulty. Type two here, it has the hydrated sheets of a cortical fibers running across from one side to other side, and the pockets are beneath that. In such cases, if you make an opening in the entire capsule, it doesn't allow the fluid to come out. In fact, the hydrated cortex comes out and there's a mountain, and this will have an immediate danger of a capsule going to periphery. So this is a type two, and the surgery has to be made effective in those cases. This will be not be amenable to needle aspiration because these are cortex, so you may have to do a, a small opening in the anterior capsule, then do an aspiration by aspiration methods. Here I'm supporting the capsule with the dispersive viscoelastic, complete the small opening, then do the actual aspiration of cortex in these cases so that you can flatten the convexity to concavity and then complete your capsular dexes and do surgery. So this OCT gives you analysis beyond the anti subcutaneous OCT which you do pre-op. This gives you actually what is happening in, during the surgery is very, very important. Type three will have a leakage of, a, of you can say a fluid which is oily, decreases the uh, pressure behind. Type 4 is totally milky fluid, and once you open, the milk comes out, the pressure goes down in these cases. So you have type 1 to type 4. Type 2, as I showed, is a difficult case where you have high chances of peripheral extensions, and that can be titrated, which technique is useful for uh, decreasing the entire lenticular pressure. In fact, uh, this video won the best, uh, best of show in American Academy uh, 2018. Then other area was posterior polar cataract, as I showed you the fem to second laser. It has the application in uh, posterior polar by looking into a various aspect of posterior pole of a posterior polar cataract. So you can again divide into various classification, type three, type two, one, and four. Four is where posterior capsule may be open or a defective. Type three is difficult. Type one, you can see the entire area. The OCT gives you a delineation of an entire posterior pole. You can see the posterior capsule in relation to posterior disc also. Type two again, 
Central area may not be visible. A periphery posterior capsule can be assessed. Type 3 is the uh, difficult morphology where you can't see anything beyond the posterior disc, and these are cases difficult. OCT also gives you assessment how much fluid you have injected during delineation. I'm doing delineation here. You'll see this is the delineation space. So this is the fluid which has gone for a delineation, and this is the apicortical cushion you have created. To decompression, the fluid will go off, and you can still see the posterior capsule intact. So that is the advantage of OCT, which will actually highlight what is happening during the procedure. Are you safe, or you're creating safety for yourself or not is very, very important. It also tells you that which type of posterior polar catheter you're dealing with. So this is a patient. You can see a very nice picture of a reduplicated cataract, onion peel type of appearance. So these cases will have a high chances of posterior capsule may be weaker, or it may be adherent to the entire disc. And surgery becomes difficult. If you see the OCT, this will have a difficult pattern. We call it a moth-eaten pattern, which has a very high incidence, incidence of posterior polar defect happening in these cases. I'll take you towards the end of surgery. You can see here, towards the end, you can see the linear opening in the posterior capsule. So this is a classical presentation of posterior polar cataracts with addition into posterior pole. The opening is linear, elliptical. Normally, it is a perpendicular to the 180 degree in these cases. Type 4 will have the you know, pouch or a defect in the posterior pole. You can see the OCT here. You can see the entire pouch. So you're sure this patient is going to be a very difficult case for you. And you may require to do a change in a pattern also. A new assessment for looking the posterior polar, we described this uh, sign, which is called PPCDD. That is the intraoperative posterior polar co cortical disc defect and gives you the analysis of exactly what is this defect. It is defect in the cortex, not in the posterior capsule. So if you see this defect, you are safe. So you are free of uh, worry that your posterior capsule is damaged. So this is again a type three type of posterior polar cataract. Towards the end, I'll take you towards the end here. The nucleus management is simpler. Once you take out a nucleus, you are going to reach the epicortical cushion which you have created. And OCT will give you that entire cushion is intact here. One, once I remove that, you see this defect. So this is the cortical disc defect, not into posterior capsule. So if you see this defect, your posterior capsule will be intact, and you don't have to worry that it's going to damage your planning as such. So this is the end of surgery. You can see I have aspirating the cortex. Now you can see a clear posterior capsule and you can implant any type of lens, whichever you have planned for, that may be toric, multifocal, can be implanted. The idea here is a good pre-op assessment and good intra-op assessment in terms of uh, dynamics of uh, procedures, how it goes. So you can say, uh, and this posterior polar uh, video got the best award uh, from AACRS, as well as from uh, AIOS uh, last, last year also. Very little, I'll just go to the last part, which is the modern IOS. In IOS, we are not looking for a visual equity alone. As I said, we are looking for visual quality. And what is a visual quality in a human being? It is a binocularity. And this is what we did. This was a multifocal IOL uh, EDOF lenses. We looked for the stereo equity for a after bilateral implantation. Not only for distance, we looked for near and intermediate also. And we realized these stereo equity were as good as monofocal lenses with a modern day multifocal lenses also. That may be uh, your uh, lenses with trifocal lenses, that may be EDOF lens. Other lens which came in between were the lens which is ozone treated, like maybe next. We studied for a long term, how does the posterior capsule correlate with the posterior surface, the eyewell, which is supposed to get adherent for these patients. And we realized they did get adherent to posterior po pole, and the PCO was very less with these lenses. So this is what happens with the newer generation devices and surgical techniques also. Last, we could acquire during the COVID time the uh, heads of 3D systems where you could operate sitting away from the microscope oculus and viewing the uh, large, the 4K 60-inch uh, 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 monitor and doing surgery off. And that was classically good for surgeon because your head position, neck position remains better. You are seeing a better magnification better illumination, and you have OCT also attached in these cases and gives you a nice access. In COVID time, we could have patient away from the patient uh, surgeon, and the people could be away. You have to see with the polarized lenses, and the surgeons, the staff, and the student could do the same surgery at the same time. Just to summarize my entire journey in one minute, I started with intracapsular surgery. You can see I was young and a lot of hair at that time. 
I, I was doing a torchlight examination, which is shifted to IL Master 700. We used to have a workshop for a seven days. Now we have uh, rapidity in these workshops. Now we do microscopy surgeries, image guided procedures, and you have a system which can titrate the intraocular pressure with your FACO handpiece as such now and improves the quality of vision for your patients. The journey has been wonderful for the last two, three decades, but only thing is keeping pace with the technology which comes in your way and you have to get used to because every few years there are new challenges coming to surgeons and those challenges have to be accepted and bring the best out of those uh, equipments, those instruments and go further, enhance your acceptance to these uh, newer challenges and go further. So this is the uh, best way you can go forward where your people can see, your student can see what you are doing and uh, you, you, you can't hide anything from them. So this is the, what I say has been my journey, ups and down. Ultimately, you're going to reach the pinnacle of your expertise, but that may not be end of your uh, triumph. You don't, uh, unless you do something better, that is training your younger generation, making them better than yourself, and making them teacher for the country, teacher for the world, and promoting the research, innovation in the field would be actual dedication your win and term for yourself. The true victory would be ultimately not yours, it will for your people. Just to end with the, this saying from a Majlu Sultan Puri, Main akela hi chala tha janibe manjil magar, log saath aate gaye aur karwa banta gaya. I think that is what happens if you take people along with you, with yourself, with system, with institution, with technology. Thank you for uh, your kind listening. Take pride in how far you have come. Have faith in how far you can go, but don't forget to enjoy the journey throughout your life. Thank you and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Titial. And we at KSO is really honored to have you uh, here. I, I request you all to uh, give a standing ovation to uh, Dr. Titial. <laughs> thank you.